In this scene, we're going to be creating the magnetic field of a bar magnet. Firstly, we'll create the magnetic field lines using splines and cloners. We'll then connect up these lines to a flow field object. We'll even export and import to allow us to duplicate our field. Finally, we'll utilize our magnetic system to emulate a classic iron filings experiment. So let's get started. Okay, so here we are in Cinema 4D and we have a piece of geometry in here. It's a, a standard bar magnet with its uh, north and south, uh, red for north, blue for south. And this is gonna be the prop that's gonna be the motivation for our magnetic field that we're gonna create. Now this is a classic sort of uh, physics diagram in which we actually can visualize the, the magnetic field of this bar magnet. And if I draw some lines, and these are known as magnetic field lines, these are a representation of if you put, say a compass anywhere on this particular line, the north and south of the compass, and if I actually go to the doodle tool and just so let's emulate that, uh, let's do red first, would be pointing like so, and if I do blue, like so, and then same down here, because the if you put two uh, a magnet together, one of these particular standard magnets, the the if you put two norths together, they repel, and the opposites attract, or and they'll aim towards it. So, if we put another one on this side of the line, we would get another compass pointing that way, and that's what these field lines are. They are simply a representation of the direction of the magnetic field at that point. And we also get them kind of going out this way and they would continue all the way off out to sort of miles away. And there we go. And the strength actually diminishes as it, as it moves further away as well. So instead of this crude diagram that I've created here, we're gonna create this in a much nicer way. And we're gonna use these splines that we're gonna the, create these field lines with to drive the direction in our flow field. So I'm gonna disable the doodle object for now, and we're gonna start adding some splines. So in the spline menu up here, I'm going to add a cycloid object spline. I'm gonna add that like so. And I'm gonna change the plane to ZY, and then I'm actually gonna rotate it. So I'm gonna grab the rotate tool on the bank there to 90 degrees. So I held shift there just to make sure it's capped to it's quantizing the rotation. So I've hit it exactly 90 degrees. And you can see, if I go to the top view, that this is a nice, useful shape for, for creating a representation of our field. Now this is only a representation of our field. We're not generating this using the maths behind a magnetic field, but we're gonna create a very good visual representation of it. So you can see here, our cycloid has a few input parameters, and between these parameters, it creates interesting uh, shapes and curves. And you can see it goes from this flat one all the way out to this nice and curled one, and it's going to be perfect just to, to create our representation of our, of our field. So I'm going to actually make this A value much larger at 400. I'm going to zero this back out, so I'm going to go to its coordinates tab, just right click those, and it'll just zero back out. And then I'm going to create another one. So I'm going to add, take this cycloid that we've got here, with its uh, new settings, new parameters, and I'm going to duplicate that. I'm actually going to reduce this right back down. This is what it's going to start like. This is the inner line, and we're going to blend between these. So if you look, as it evolves, I'm going to blend between these. So I'm going to put this one here and I'm gonna make it 25, like so. And then I'm going to put both of these inside a cloner object. Now, what this is gonna allow us to do, if I go to the MoGraph menu up here, add a cloner, and I'm just gonna grab them both and drop them in there. Now, it's reset the transform, so if I go back to our 3D viewport, you can see it's actually made them go vertical again on the, the uh, what is that, the YZ plane. Uh, I'm going to actually rotate them back down and we can do that inside the cloner itself. So transform and then the bank 90 degrees again. So they're flat to the Z X plane. 
and we're going to go and check some of the main cloner settings because this is the main part we're changing here. So you can see all it's doing now, if I increase the count, it's just simply iterating between the two and uh, moving them up 50 units each time we clone. So I'm going to first of all remove the offset of the on the Y value. Then I'm going to change the mode. This is where the magic happens. When I change the mode, the clones mode from iterate to blend, it's now going to blend between these two shapes. So all the parameters and all the coordinates uh, values between these two objects, if they find a matching, if the cloner sees a matching parameter, it will blend between these values. So this value obviously is 25 and the second one is already 25, but the A value is 25 on this one and 400 on this one. So actually, I'm going to rename these so we can identify them nice and quickly. So this is the, I'm going to call that outer. And I'm going to call this one inner. Now I'm going to put the inner one to the top here. And that just helps us when we're, we're doing our next thing, which is correcting the offset. So if we look here, we can see this isn't exactly like our, our field lines. They all emanate from the same point. They, they emanate from the poles of the magnet. So you can see these are all currently offset. And that's because our cycloid, its axis is zero and it does an offset when you generate the, the points from it, the, the, the spline shape. So what we need to do is we need to correct that offset and we can use that, the, the uh, offsetting in the actual cloner itself. If I change it to endpoint and on the X value, you can see as I move it, we can correct that offset. And this value is actually relative to some of the values in our cycloids. And what I mean by that is if I click on the outer one, you see we have this 400 for the A value here and 25 for the radius. And if I go back to the cloner, you can see if I do 400 minus 25, we get a nice perfect clustering of the points. They come out of this, this point here. So the advantage of this is now we can create these field lines and we can create as many as we like and you can blend between them. Now for our purposes, we don't need too many. So I'm just gonna go for seven. And we can also, if we select both of the cycloids at the same time, we can actually change this radius. But I've already set this up so that this bar magnet suits the 25 default units. So if I go to the, our top view and I move our cloner down, like so, you can see that that's looking quite good for our particular flow, our magnetic field. So I'm gonna undo that offset. We will correct that later, but that's uh, gonna come next. So now we've created the these the cycloid, these inner lines, there are some more. So these would actually go off sort of infinitely if we did the maths equations and you'd actually get m way more if we increase the size of this hugely and eventually it creates almost an exact vertical uh, perpendicular line up this way, up the z-axis. But we're not we're not we're only doing the representation remember so we don't need to worry too much about the accuracy there but we do want some lines here otherwise the flow field won't have any information to go on so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create some uh, extra lines using the mo spline so again let's go to the mo graph menu and we're going to add a mo spline now this mo spline here it's uh, set to a default of uh, uh, 200 units and 100 steps and I'm going to place it so that it comes out of the pole here. Now to do this, it's useful to use the snapping. So I'm going to actually, if I hold down here, you'll see I can enable snap. And then if I hold down again, I can just double check. It's going to use the vertices to snap to. So then all I need to do is I just need to move our most spline onto that beginning vertex there. If I zoom in, you'll see it's slightly offset. So just zoom in, make sure it's zero on the X. And then we go, that's our Z offset. Let's zoom back out and I'm going to make it much longer because we're going to actually curl these. We're going to curve them to kind of match our magnetic field lines from the cycloids. So I'm going to make this say 1250 and I'm going to duplicate that. So I've already duplicated it and I'm going to create a curve. So you can see with these parameters on the, the simple spline uh, panel in the most spline object, I can actually curve these splines. So you can see, obviously I need to go to negative X and I'm actually gonna do an exact hemicircle, so semicircle, so negative 180. 
that's created a semicircle, but you can see it's not perfect because we've got this offset on Z and the cycloid is, is operating on a different equation, so it's not a perfect circle. So what we need to do is we need to open up the spline um, parameter, the spline dialog in the curve just by hitting the twirl down there. And I'm gonna grab this point here and I'm just gonna bring it down. If you look at the viewport as I do that, you can see it kind of brings it closer to our original cycloid um, spline here. Now we don't need it to be absolutely perfect. We just need it to be enough that it looks visually good. And we're actually going to remove this one. These are just two states to blend between. So we blend between this one and this one, and we'll actually remove this original one when we connect all the splines up. So uh, to get that more accurate, we can just increase the length here a touch like so. And if we just get it visually nice like so, and that's close enough, like about there. Okay, so if we zoom back out and we get another cloner. So we need to create a cloner at the same point as the Mo spline. And that's because if we created it down at world zero, it would just shift both of our Mo splines down in Z like so. So we don't want it to do that. We just want to add a cloner exactly in this place. So what we can do is we can, when we've got the cloner in the menu here, if you hold Alt on Windows or Option on Mac, you just let go on that. And now the cloner has become a parent of the Mo spline and also it's inherited its position. So now we're gonna drop the second Mo spline. So in there, and then we need to set up our cloner much like we did the first one. So I'm actually gonna rename this one so we can see it nice and clearly. It's just good practice. So cycloid, and then this one, we're gonna change. So we're gonna go back to the 3D viewport, the perspective viewport, so hit F1, and there we go. And I'm gonna drop the offset. We don't need the offset there. And in fact, we're going to change the clones mode to blend. And you can see there we've got this, this blend between. We've only got three count, but you can see we can increase that enormously, but we don't need to, of course. And I'm just gonna create probably seven intermediate lines. So we can imagine these lines continuing round and coming back in the South Pole here. So they're flowing around and then back in. But because our flow field is only gonna be within a certain contained area and the strength of the magnetic field is gonna reduce as, as it moves further away, um, we don't need to worry about area beyond here. So now that we've got these, we can check a few things on the defaults of the actual Mo spline itself. So remember we turned off, uh, or we, we took a look at the cycloids here, and the cycloids actually have, they create points, and then those points are connected. Now, Cinema 4D, if it thinks there aren't enough, or when there are not enough points, it allows you to add intermediate points that smooth out that spline. Now, we don't want it to do that. We actually want to keep this fairly optimized. So I'm actually going to turn off the intermediate points on the cycloid objects, the cycloid splines, and likewise, on the most spline object, I'm gonna reduce the number of steps we have in them. So if you look here, if I just reduce these down, I've got both of the most splines selected. And as I reduce them down to really low values, you can see uh, with only two steps, we get these, uh, these <laughs> just uh, sharp angles. So we obviously want more than that, but we don't want too many. So I'm actually gonna set it to 32 and that's plenty. So we've got a nice smooth curves out in the outer areas and then the cycloids themselves are not too dense. Okay, so now we've got this particular cloner. I should rename these splines, of course. So if you take a look at this spline, this one can be our inner spline, our most spline, and this one can be the outer, like so. And we've created that now. Now, of course, we need to create a mirror image of this. We need to create the same field lines coming in to the South Pole. So simply we can just duplicate this cloner. So we can call this one most spline north. And then if I duplicate that, just holding control or command whilst dragging, and then I'm just gonna call this one most spline south. Now I can't see the, 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 the bottom part of our, of our spline. So I'm gonna hide our bar magnet for the second, for the moment. And I'm going to 
going to move our cloner down to the zero point. So this is where all the other cycloids are emanating from. Then I'm going to rotate it. So I'm going to hit R. I'm going to rotate it on this axis. And I'm going to hold shift whilst I do so. And it's going to be 180 degrees pitch. So you can see now this is starting to take shape. We're starting to see our magnetic field. So one thing I want to do is I want to make sure that our magnetic field is centered on our bar magnet. So let's unhide the bar magnet. And currently it's offset due to the way that the cycloids generate. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take the two most blind cloners and select them both. And you'll see because the axes are at the beginning and the end of the cycloid spline, if I hold those two together and I hold Alt and then G, it groups them in a null. And that now is centered between those two. So they will equally be 78.54 units positive and negative on Z. And then I just need to drag in my cycloid cloner, grab my null, go to the coordinates tab, and just I can zero it here. So I can right click and that'll zero that on that axis. Okay, so we're getting somewhere with our field lines. And what we want to do now is we actually want to connect them all into one object. And then we're going to deal with the direction of the splines themselves. So if I grab each of these and I right click and I hit this connect objects option here and you'll see it's created a spline object and now I'm going to actually hide these original ones. I'm going to actually take this particular one that we've just created, this spline here. I'm going to re rename this as planar field lines because they're flat at the moment. So planar field lines and then this one we're just going to call field lines build and this is just so that if we ever need to come back and rechange things we can always have it there and i'm going to disable them just hit the enabled signs there and i'm going to hide that and put it to the bottom of our hierarchy so that's just some housekeeping so now we've selected our planar uh, field lines i want to zero out the axis here you can see it's currently it's set over to the center of its bounding box so i'm just going to activate the axis tool and I'm going to make it a zero. And then I'm going to uh, take a look at the actual direction of the splines. So let's uncheck the axis mode and go to points mode. And we can see we've got our field lines and we've got a decent number of subdivisions. And the cycloid splines and the most splines are intersecting here. So let's deal with that first. So you can see that quite clearly because they've got different numbers of points and where they're generated. They're not perfectly aligned, so we need to get rid of our most blinds. So if we zoom into the central point here, you can see them. This is where the most blinds actually uh, connected or, or came to a point almost. And I'm just going to select the two endpoints of both of those most blinds. I don't want to select the cycloid spline, so be careful not to do that. I'm going to zoom back out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a command called select connected. So select connected is just going to find all the points connected before there are any breaks in the spline. You can see it's selected those two, what were most splines. I'm just gonna hit backspace to get rid of those. And now we have no more overlapping splines. And we can focus on the direction of these splines. Now in cinema, when you have points mode active and a spline object selected, um, this particular spline object here, we can see that they go from white to blue. So white is the beginning of the spline and blue is the end. And that's of course important for our flow field direction. So you can see here it flows around and we've got from the start is white and the end is blue. However, on the cycloids here, the white starts at the south pole and comes around to the north. And that's the incorrect, that's the opposite direction of what we want. And equally our, um, our most splines on the south pole here are all going in the wrong direction as well. So what we need to do is we need to select all of them. And if I just grab our selection, uh, live selection tool, I can just select a bunch of points and make sure I get at least one point from each of these splines. And we're going to run the same command we just did, which is select connected. We can of course find that in the commander. So if you shift C as the default, so we could do select connected. And I've even got a shortcut, which is UW. So select connected. And then that's selected all the points on those. And now I'm going to run the reverse point order or reverse order 
on the spline and I can just right click and it's a contextual menu. So you can see it's got all the point uh, operations and this is the one we want here. We want to reverse the sequence. So I've reversed the sequence and you might have noticed the colors flipped. So I'm going to unselect, just click over there. And you can see we've got the white all the way around, blue at the south. So that's perfect now. And we've got our nice flow lines. Okay. So one more operation I want to do before we, we, we are, we're done with the planar field lines. And that's actually to remove the center line. So currently the center line is part of those original most blinds. And just like we removed the ones at the end here, I want to remove these ones because otherwise we're going to get overlapping when we create an array of them. So I'm just going to hide the bar magnet. And you can see they don't actually even go through the center of our field, which we are going to want. So we're going to create another spline later on to do that. But once again, we're just going to select a point on each of these uh, segments. And then I'm going to run select connected. And then I'm going to hit backspace and clear those out. Okay, so now we've created our planar field lines. I want to create this 3D uh, field effect by arraying them around our z-axis here. So we're going to do that, of course, with a cloner. And let's add that from the top menu. So MoGraph menu, cloner, like so. And I'm just going to drop our planar field lines inside there. Now our cloner is set to the default, of course, to offset on Y. So we need to zero that out. But we do want to have it offset the or per step offset the bank of our of our field. So you can see here, um, as I increase it, I could go around all the way to 360. However, what I want to do is I actually want to do it per step. So I'm going to say, uh, if I look down the Z axis right now, that's a reasonable uh, sort of number of these these it, these lines in the array because we don't want to go too dense. But actually, the field. Uh, the flow field will interpret interpolate between these and we'll get like a nice balance. Uh, if you're finding you're, you're getting stepping in the field, you can just increase or decrease this banking number. But for our purpose right now, it's no problem. So we've done a 15 degree bank. We need to work out how many clones we need around. Now we could do this visually, no problem. However, if, you're, if you've got a high number or, a, or like a, a low number, a low banking value, we need to create a large number of these this count and it can be quite tricky. An easy way to do that is just to say 360, so 360 degrees and divide that by 15. And that gives us 24. And if I just notch it back by one, you can see that's created one clone of our field lines, of our planar field lines, each 15 degree step. So if I now rotate around in the viewport, we're going to start seeing a 3D representation of our field lines. And this might look familiar if you looked at any physics papers on, on magnetism. And you can see this is pretty much exactly what we're going to be using for our flow field. Okay, so now I've created this, I'm actually going to merge it together again as one whole object. So much as we did before, the field lines build, I'm actually going to duplicate this cloner Actually, first of all, let's name it. Let's call it um, uh, well, Field Lines Array. So Field Lines Array. And I'm going to duplicate that and put it into the Fields build. If we ever need to come back to it, it's good to store it in there. Uh, and now what we can do is we can make this editable. Uh, we can connect. We want this all to be one object again. So the way of doing this is actually because because we don't have multiple objects selected, the connect objects command so right click if i you'll see they're grayed out so connect objects and connect objects and delete is grayed out and that's because we don't have multiple objects selected so as long as we have uh, two objects selected we can run that command and what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to just drop a null i'm going to put it below the cloner this is just a trick and then select them both and now when i right click you'll see we're able to connect the objects and i'm going to run connect objects and delete and there we go. We've now got our merged field lines array and it's ready to be used inside the flow field object. So let's do that next and let's hide our field lines array for now. Jump up to our X particles menu and we're going to add a system object. Now the system object defaults, it's added an emitter for me and the actual defaults up here, it's got an icon in the viewport, which I'm going to turn off and then I'm going to turn on 
only modifiers in the same system and only deformers. I always put those on at default. So we've got an emitter in here. We don't need that on just for now. I'm just gonna turn that off. And I'm gonna to go to the dynamics null up here. So if I click on this and we go down to the attributes window, you can see that we have a drop down called dynamics objects. And you'll see when I open it up, we have the XP flow field. So I've dropped our flow field in and I'm gonna change the mode from the, the flow mode from default to a long spline. And then I'm gonna drag our field lines array into the object field. Now immediately you can see in the viewport and I'm gonna zoom in, our flow field changed its look and you can see we have arrows pointing along our, our magnetic field lines. And that's a very good, uh, good sign because that's exactly what we want. Uh, I'm gonna reduce this down to just one cell thick on the Y axis. So I'm gonna drop that down to 20 and I'm gonna make the cell size 20. And you can see, just to verify, and we're gonna turn our bar magnet back on. You can see from north to south, the flow lines, the magnetic field is flowing all the way into the south here. Now you can see a change in color here, and the change in color is simply the strength of the field. And the strength at the, at the current default state in the flow field object, go back to it here, and when we're in the along spline mode, it's using this fall off option. Now we're actually not gonna use the fall off, we're going to use um, some traditional Cinema 4D fall off to create a sort of a spherical fall off around our magnet later on. So we don't need this on, so I just turn it off. You can see now all the, the, the cell vectors, the arrows are all the same color and they're, they're doing a great job of flowing from north to south. Okay, so and if I increase this, of course, it goes out to here and then eventually it'll get beyond the spline and there'll be no more data for it to, to interpret. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna create a very large flow field so that our particles can be affected from quite far away, but it just has to encapsulate this, this array here. So I'm just gonna hide that now. And I'm going to, before I change this to a huge size, it's worth noting that when having to generate all the cell vectors, the flow field is gonna be doing some heavy processing if we have a huge size with a small cell size. So whilst you're working with it, you might just wanna increase it to a large value. I'm, I'm gonna do 100. And then we can add some much larger values in without having to have it regenerate uh, and be uh, you know, delayed. So I'm actually gonna make it longer in Z, of course, because if you remember our field, our array here is like so. And we could extend it beyond that, but actually our fall off is gonna cap it off around inside this, this zone anyway. So currently it's at 1500. Uh, by 1500 on X and Y, and then Z, it's a bit longer at 2000. So right now our field strength is at 10%. And if I hide our flow field, or in fact, actually I'm gonna leave our flow field bounds on, and I'm gonna go to the display tab, show vectors, just turn that off like so. Now when I put our emitter back on, and I'm gonna put it in here, let's hide our field array as well. I'm actually gonna place that inside our system object so that if we ever save this as a preset, it will save these lines as well. So the emitter here, currently set to just a default uh, rectangle. And if I rotate this so that it's moving along, it's uh, flat along the Z Y plane, and I'm just gonna increase the size of it quite a lot, like so. Okay. And now when I hit play, you'll see the particles do flow and they move and they end up in this kind of uh, zone here where they end up clustering up. And I'm gonna increase the timeline significantly just so we can get a decent amount of, of playback time, like so. So you can see our, our particles are following the field lines. We're ending up at this weird equilibrium here. And remember, I have a very large cell size currently set. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the general tab. I'm gonna change the direction to a full 100% and I'm actually going to change the cell size down to 50 units and like I said that's going to take a second to generate but it won't be too long and there we go that's done 
press play and you can see we're getting this nice flow. Now you'll notice these particles are clustering at the south pole here. And now why is that? Well, we don't have any vectors going through the, we don't have any, any data telling the vectors to move through the center line. If you recall, we deleted those center lines earlier on. So we actually need to add a center line to our field array here. So let me just uh, turn off the emitter, unhide our field lines array. We can turn off the flow field as well whilst we're doing this. And then we're going to add a center line. So I'm just going to add an end spline, or sorry, an end side spline. And I'm going to set it to two sides. And I'm going to set it to basically be the same length or a little bit longer than our array here. So it's currently 2,500. So if we did 2,750 and make sure it's on the ZY axis. That might even be too long. In fact, it's, uh, it's of course, it's too long because it's double that. So divide that by two and we get a nice center line. Um, we, you can add some subdivisions to this, but it's unnecessary. I'm going to make it editable. And if we go to the points, we can see the, the start is here and the end is here. And that's correct because we actually want the, if we select the field lines array, you can see the white ones are all on this side. The flow is around the magnet north to south. Okay, so let's drag our, let's call this our center line. And then we can actually add this as a, an, an additional um, source object for our flow field. I'm gonna drag that in here. And if I do our trick of just flattening it down to one cell size and showing our display, we can see the effect this is gonna have on our, so you can see here, currently we have an, uh, an even number of uh, cells so there's a there's no vector in the center here so what we could do is we could set this to 40 and you'll see we get a center line and you can see all of those vectors are pointing perfectly up through the center there okay so excellent that's exactly what we wanted i'm going to go back to the flow field display turn off the vectors again general and return this to 1500 units it's generating those, of course, and then I can put our emitter back on. And now we should see some particles flowing through the center as well. So you can see they're kind of moving up through the center and out through the north. Now, really a good way to visualize this is if we use a trail object. So I'm going to add a trail object. So with, with the emitter selected, I'm going to run the commander and I'm going to add an XP trail object. And I can just put that in the generators area there. I'm also going to set the thickness and color data to none just to keep it efficient. We don't need to store it. And then we can press play. And now we're starting to see something really cool. So this is the start of what we're going to be creating with our, our magnetic field. And you can see it's two dimensional at the moment, or it's, it's pulling some off into the three dimensional, but the majority is two dimensional. But we're getting a really good representation of our magnetic field. Now, the only disadvantage here with trail objects is if I transform the flow field or if I transform the field array, the, the field lines themselves, the trails won't react to that change. They will just continue being a trail and we'll actually get a mush of stuff. So what we need to do is we actually need to have active particles trailing our emitter to really represent uh, our magnetic field. So I'm going to turn the trail object off and we actually, in fact, we can actually delete that because we won't be using that again. And I'm going to add a modifier called the tendril modifier. Now, what this is going to do, so if we go to the generate, and at the bottom of the generate modifiers is the XP tendril. And what this simply does is it adds a particle behind the original particle. So the source particle is this emitter here. If I press play, you'll see it essentially creates a trail of particles. It's actually generating particles behind the original um, source particle. So the advantage of this is if, if I transform the field, so if I now just at this point, uh, in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to make our magnet the parent of these two field lines and field arrays. And I'm going to rotate these. Now, if I rotate these whilst our flow field is active, there'll be a bit of lag because it's generating constantly. So you might want to turn your flow field off for a second, transform, have it go that way or something like that, and then turn the flow field back on and then it'll generate a few couple of seconds, not even that, and we're back on. So if I hit play now, you'll see the, the 
field is now transforming and we're actually getting a different magnetic field at this point. Now it's still very, very dense because we are continuously adding particles to our simulation here. So we need to reduce that down and we can do that by going to the emitter itself. Uh, we, could we could reduce the birth rate down somewhat, like to 500. And then on the tendril object itself, we're actually going to make it a, a shorter trail. So we're going to do that by turning off scene length tendril. And we're going to drop it down to say, let's do 40 to start with. Like so. And there we go. We're getting a nice representation of our field and it's not getting too overloaded. But we are, uh, our particles, our source particles are staying around a bit too long as well. So we can change their lifespan to 40 as well. That might be too short, but there we go. So that's looking really cool. And this will now react quite quickly to everything, our, our changes as we, we move the emitter through the field itself. So you can see I can move the emitter around and you can see we're getting a representation of the field. Now, as I move it out of the flow field, of course, the emitters particles are no longer under the influence and they'll just go off in that direction. So one thing we definitely want to make sure is that there's a nice fall off around the flow field itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a fall off, uh, a spherical fall off. So I'm going to go to the spherical tab here, uh, sorry, the fall off tab here, add a spherical field. And you can see that is added to the center there. Just going to turn off our flow field object whilst we make these changes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the side view. And if we look at our our bounds here. I'm going to increase the size of this right up like that. And then I actually want it to be a bit elongated in this axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to object mode on the left over here. And I'm just going to grab the Z axis. I'm just going to extend it along there. Now when I turn our flow field on, I want to make sure it's within those bounds. So it is. That's good. And now if I press play, our flow field is going to stop affecting the particles outside of that point. Now, it's a fairly abrupt change there. So what I'm probably going to do is um, go to the remapping area of the fall off here, the field. And I'm going to create a much smoother fall off. If we go to contour, and um, we could go to quadratic. And then I'm going to actually make this a nice gentle curve, let's say 50%. Like so. And then we could also change the inner offset so it, it decays all the way from the center here. And you can see that's a bit of a smoother effect now out to the outside of the field. All right, so we've now got our rather cool looking magnetic field system. Now, if we want to, say, animate the magnet within the field so we can move the magnet around, that's going to be quite expensive because, as, as you'll see, if I move this, the flow field has to regenerate each time I do that. And so that's going to be a bit of a, a delay to do that. And it's going to be quite expensive on the processing power. So I'm actually going to reset the position of this magnet. Um, and I can actually run the PSR reset command. So reset PSR. And I'm going to do that. And you can see the flow field regenerates. And then we're back to where we were. Now, obviously, if that magnet is animating, it's going to be too expensive. So there's a trick here we can use. And I'm going to go to my flow field itself. And I'm going to go to the object tab. And I'm going to import. So import and export is actually designed for exporting and importing flow fields between Unreal Engine and the flow field and cinema with X particles. So this is going to be the file name we're going to export to. So I can actually hit the dots here. And we can call it uh, bar magnet field. And this particular flow field is in a long spline flow field. So I'm going to call it a long. Then I'm going to go version one, just in case we, we do multiples, iterations. I'm going to hit save. Now, that's not saved it. That's saved the file name. Uh, to save it, I'm going to have to hit the save flow field. So hit save flow field. And that's now saved an FGA to that folder. Now, before I load back in, I'm actually going to duplicate our flow field because I don't want to... I want to be able to go back to this flow field and um, play around with the parameters if, if anything in the particular export isn't I'm not happy with. So I'm just going to disable it and I'm going to duplicate it. And I'm going to call this one 
along. And I'm going to call this one along as well, but I'm going to call it along export. Well, actually, let's call it along FGA because then we know it's imported. So right now, I'm going to turn it back on like so. And I'm going to hit the, I'm now going to hit the load flow field like so. And then there's an FGA in here, of course. We can just double click that. And now it's just loaded that data in. Now, the cool thing about this is, is that if I go to show the vectors, you can see it's all very, very dense. But if I zoom in, you'll see that we're getting that data from north to south was actually saved in there. In fact, the best way to see this is to see the particles moving within the field, just as a, a proof that it's still working. And there we go. So our, our flow field is now saved as a FGA object. If I go to the general tab, you can see I can still change the percentage on the direction, but everything else is grayed out because that was already generated by the by saving the FGA and importing it now. So the advantage of this is performance. And this is really cool. So if I now take this whole flow field and I make it a child of our bar magnet and I move our bar magnet around, you can see we can actually move the magnet through the field and it will change the particles no matter where I place it. So this is really cool because now we can also duplicate these and we can have multiple of these. So I'm gonna put another one over here. And because of the fall off, we get a nice blend between them like so. And now we're getting a really interesting system. So I'm gonna reset the positions of these and we're gonna set up a nicer looking particle emitter. So right now we've got this flat emitter and the tendrils are all this one green color. But what I can do is if I go to the display tab of the emitter, I can go from changing the color mode to a single color, which is the green at default, to gradient parameter. And you can see immediately that's more interesting and it's just based on the age of the particles. But I want to do it based on the direction of the particles. So if I go to direction, and you can see immediately there's an interesting look here. So all the particles that are moving just on Z are white at the moment, and any of that are changing their heading are changing to the blue at this end. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load in a more interesting looking gradient. So load in a gradient, and we could just use the uh, this one here, it's called Candy. And you can see we have a very interesting looking flow field. Now, one thing to note here is that the flow field field mode, so if I open it up here and select our FGA um, flow field, is that it is set to direction. That means it's not giving the particles any velocity itself. And if I go to the emitter and turn off the speed of the emitter, so emission, and so now the particles all have zero speed, we don't actually see anything happening because the flow field is not pushing them, it's not moving them along. So if I jump back to the flow field, we can actually change it to velocity and it'll move the particles along. But you'll note that we cannot change the speed value because that was baked in on the export. Um, so whilst that's useful, it means that we have to get the velocity correct before we export and that's not particularly convenient. So what I advise is always export in the direction mode and then drive the speed elsewhere. So either from the emitter or and this is a fun way of doing it, is we could just grab a speed modifier. And you can see we could just set this to an absolute speed, say of uh, 500. And now we have sort of a speed controller for our, our the, f the magnetic flow that we've got going here. So now that we've got our system set up, we can actually utilize this to create a kind of a more practical example. And there's a really classic physics experiment where you'll, you'll probably have seen it already, but where you put a magnet in a, on a sheet of iron filings and those iron filings will orient along the field lines that we've created. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna utilize the system we have here, but we're gonna actually keep this one as it was. So this is our original bar magnet field. And I'm going to duplicate this system. In fact, we don't need the XP system prefix. I'm going to duplicate that system, put it above, and I'm going to deactivate our bar magnet field. I'm actually going to hold control and turn absolutely everything off underneath. If I open that, you can see even the splines and stuff. And then I'm just going to hide that like so. Okay, so let's rename this, this new one. Let's call this one Iron Filings. Okay, and let's change the color of our of our system just to contrast and be able to jump back to it whenever we need to. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to go into our hierarchy here and we're going to clean it up a little bit. We only actually need, now that we've created the the flow field itself and stored it as this the file, the FGA file, we can actually get rid of all the stuff that created it. So we can delete the splines that were were the actual field lines. We can even delete the original flow field. And also these original modifiers here, we're not going to be using speed here. So we're actually going to be having static particles so we can get rid of both speed and tendrils because there won't be any trails. And now we've got a very simple system with an emitter, the bar magnet and its associated flow field. And I'm going to actually hide that flow field. So it's nice and tidy. And if I just hit press play now, we won't see anything happening. And that's because we have no representation of the orientation of the particles. So I'm going to change the display mode of our emitter here. And I'm going to go to display. And it's currently set to dots. And if I change it to lines, but we're not going to use lines dependent on speed. We're going to use lines of a fixed radius or of the radius of the particles. So I'm going to go to the line length drop down dependent on radius. So this is now going to give us a fixed line length of our particles. Now they're still quite small in the, in the view here. And that's because if we go to the emission tab, the radius is quite small. So as you see, as I increase them, say to 20 units, you can now see them and you can see them orienting correctly towards our magnet. And this is really cool because we can increase the number quite dramatically. And you can see our field is working nicely. And then if I move the magnet through the field, we get this really interesting looking orientation of these particles and they, they point towards it. And if I now duplicate this magnet, and if I just change to world mode so I can just move it on the X and uh, Z plane, sorry, the Y, Z plane, I can just move it through, I can rotate it, and you can see they can all mix together. And if I duplicate it again, we can put one down here as well. So you can see this is a really cool effect and they're currently stood far away. So if I just bring them right into intersect the field, you'll get this more classic look. Okay, so we want to do this, but we want to do this on static particles. You can see they're kind of moving and they have kind of, they're flickering as they're sort of changing direction. And that's actually because we're continually adding particles and having them die 40 frames in. We actually just want to start with a plane of particles. So I'm going to go for a shot. And I'm going to go for a decent amount, say 10,000 particles, and I'm going to go for the full lifespan. So like so, now they're fixed. And you can see now when I move the magnets through the field, the particles remain in their place and they don't die off and, and be reborn. But you can see we create this really interesting effect. And the color representation here is the heading of the particles, of course. And I can change that here in the display tab and we can try different ones. You could try the bank and you get a slightly different look and then pitch even still again. And as we rotate this, you'll see we get different effects to the field. And the more particles there are, of course, the, the perhaps the better representation, but you don't want it so dense that you can't actually see any separation between them. Okay, so here are our, now we've got our iron filings. I'm going to give them a bit of variation in their length just to make them look a bit more natural. So I'm going to give them a variation of 10. And that's just going to scatter them a bit more like they, they do in, in real life. And I'm also obviously going to make this on the X Z plane because it's going to be where our magnets are going to fall onto a surface. So we're going to go to the Object tab. And we're going to change the Emitter plane to Y plus, like so. And I'm also going to make it an even sized square. So let's do 2000 by 2000, like so. And you can see the fields are still affecting and I can move these around still within those fields and they'll point to the magnet. Uh, but we're going to have to deal with another problem. And that is that when they're born, they are all pointing upwards. So if we go back to frame zero and let's actually um, clean up our magnets, I'm actually going to get rid of these ones for now. And let's, um, let's reset the PSR of this original mag magnet. So reset PSR, put it in there in the zero. And we're going to turn off the flow field for now. So if I nudge along one frame, we can zoom in and we can see that our particles are all pointing upwards. Now this is slightly different to the display mode such as arrow 
or um, the pyramid or geometric shape. So if I go to the emitters display tab, we're currently set to lines and display uh, dependent on radius mode. Now, the difference between lines and arrows is that lines are only going to utilize the particle's direction and not their rotation. So what that means is, is that if I go to our extended data tab and I go to use rotation and I set this to random mode and I go back to frame zero and then nudge forward one, you'll see that our particles are still all pointing upwards and they're not in random directions. Well, the random here sets the rotation and not the direction of the particle. They are two separate values. So I'm gonna go back to our display tab. If I go to arrow and I actually hit force display, you'll see that our arrows are, are actually correctly facing all different directions. But because we're doing this project as a, as a viewport project, I want to be able to use these lines. So how are we gonna randomize these lines at the beginning of our animation and have them flat to our surface when we're in the line display mode? Well, there's a little trick we can do here. And since this is a flow field tutorial, we can of course use another flow field. So I'm gonna to go to my dynamics tab and I'm gonna add another flow field. Now this only has to be very shallow. It only has to be as shallow um, to, to uh, one cell thick just to encapsulate the, the ground plane here. So I'm gonna set it to just a bit more than the size of that emitter, so 2200. Then I'm gonna make it 20 high and then the cell size of course, I'm gonna match that to 20. We're gonna change this now to a random direction and I'm gonna put leave the strength quite low. I'm gonna hit play and you can see immediately we have a different orientation of our particles. Now, one thing here to note is that it's kind of as if there's a, a static effect and they're all standing on end um, and moving up from the surface. And I can show that if I turn the vectors off, zoom into the surface and move down, you can see they're all pointing in completely random directions. I actually want to limit them to just the, the Y axis or sorry, the X Z plane. So I'm actually gonna add an XP limit modifier and I can grab one of these here. So this is under the motion modifiers, grab the limit. And then all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna limit the axis 100% on Y. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna give us our randomization like so, but it's fixing them on the surface plane. Now, I only want this randomization to be on the very first frame. So I just want it to be on the first frame and then I want it to deactivate. And now, and the simplest way to do that is just to simply have the flow field turn off after the first frame. So first frame, generate the particles. So we're on frame one, I've hit G to nudge it along. I'm gonna add a keyframe here on the enabled parameter of our flow field. And then the next frame along, I'll simply turn it off and add another keyframe. So now we have a way of initializing our, our plane of particles in a random state in this particular display mode. And now when I bring in our, and uh, reactivate our flow magnet, you can see we're getting this lovely orientation of our particles. Now they're currently all the same color, and that's because if we go back to our display mode in our emitter, you remember we've got our, our gradient parameter set to pitch, and it happens that pitch is not being changed on this particular axis. So it's gonna have to either be bank, and if I hit play, you'll see that change, or heading, like so. Okay, so now we've got our particles initialized, our filings initialized, and we can create more particles, of course, if we just go to the emission tab. I'm gonna add another zero, so we've got loads more, like so. And I'm thinking perhaps that's too dense, so we'll drop it back down. I'm gonna only go to 20,000. And I'm also gonna have this flow field, when it does its initial thing, um, be a bit more gentle, have a, have a bit more of a smooth flowing look to them. So I'm actually gonna increase the cell size again. And then obviously I need to increase the vertical height of the flow field. And there we go. Can you see we have an, like an initial swirling of our particles. And if uh, you've used flow fields before, you'll know that you can duplicate them and you can actually have different uh, so cell sizes per container and actually blend between them. So I'm gonna set that to 120 by 120 and you'll get an interesting sort of noise pattern. Okay, so we can call those initial rotation 
Well, actually, it's an initial direction. So initial direction. O1. Initial direction O2. So this is the larger, the smaller size. And they are literally just on that first frame setting our orientation. And you can see our magnet then comes along and orients our particles along its uh, magnetic field lines. Okay, so now we've got that set up, we're going to create the simulation and we're just going to use Cinema 4D's uh, collision system. So I'm going to add a floor object. I'm going to right click that floor object and I'm going to add a collider tag. So collider body. And then I'm going to add on the, the bar magnet here, I'm going to add uh, the, the rigid body tag as well. However, I'm not going to add it to this original magnet geometry here because I want the magnets to be identical and it's wasteful on the resources to keep duplicating the same piece of geometry over and over when you can use instancing. So I'm actually going to grab the bar magnet here and I'm going to take the flow field out of it. So I'm going to hit shift G that just disbands the group. And then I'm going to actually put this in a, in a null object and I'm going to call this magnet geometry. And then I'm simply going to hide that null. Now, the reason for doing this is organizationally, we can now create a bunch of instances from this piece of geometry without affecting the original geometry and having to add tags to each of those. So I'm gonna now add an instance. So whilst I had that selected, I hit the uh, instance object. Then I'm gonna drag that out of that hierarchy and you can see now we have an instance of our geometry. Now I'm gonna make the flow field a child of this particular one. And I'm going to call this instance one. And now this is the one that I'm going to add the dynamics tag to. So first off, we're going to lift it up off the ground. Give it some sort of random positioning. Right click it, simulation tags, and then it's going to be rigid body. Now we can leave this at default right now and see how it works. And you can see already we're getting a, a nice clean simulation where the particle the magnet falls onto the surface and we get that nice smooth transition into the, the aligned field. So all I need to do now, now that I've created this particular way of doing it, is just duplicate this one. Let's rename that O2. Move that over here. Lift it up on Y maybe. Let's have a look around like so. And I could keep doing this until I'm happy that I've got enough. In fact, we can create ones that perhaps even fall over each other like so and then to keep things tidy we can of course rename those like so and now when i press play we should see a very interesting simulation where the magnets even collide with each other and then we get this blending of their fields and the filings are all facing like so now, the filings themselves obviously aren't going to have this color to them and they don't change. So we actually could make them just simply black in the viewport. So we can make them a single color. We could do shades of gray and, and that kind of thing. But I'm just going to make them black for now. Like so. And there we go. And you're starting to see that's a really great way of creating this particular kind of simulation where the particles don't move themselves, but a field moves through them and orients them like so. And I think we can put a nice bright white material on underneath as well. On the floor object. And perhaps we can increase the number of particles a touch more. So 30,000. And there we go. So that was creating a magnetic field simulation using the flow field. It's a really good use of the flow field. And it has loads of different possibilities of moving particles through a field and having the fields themselves move through the particles to create different effects.